Hello, everyone. While we wait for more people to join us, we would like to share with you the trailer of the film that we will be discussing today. This is home, Ghana, otherwise known as Kainai, or the Blood Reserve. Nestled in the foothills of the Rocky Mountains, Kainai is the largest reserve in Canada. Beginning in 2014, fentanyl flooded the illicit drug trade on the reserve. This new reality has forced our community to approach addiction in radically different ways. Hello. The difficulty was in convincing people that harm reduction is the route that we have to take. By no means is it celebrating addiction, but what it does is it celebrates the lives of people without judgment. Hey -oh, hey -oh, hey -oh. Our group here is looking at expanding what we have to do to help our community heal. Oh, I could save a life. It's very heart-wrenching when you go on a call and people are breathless. And we can't sit back and expect things to change without doing the work. Trying to get off these ox is by yourself, it's hard. The next thing we want to do is address a detox facility on reserve. History marks the Bloods as some of the fiercest, strongest people there ever was. And I want us to get to that point again. I'm happy We have a Blackfoot word that's called Gimma Bi Bitsin, which means giving kindness to each other. And that means also compassion for those who are suffering. It's an amazing thing that they've done. And in my eyes, they're heroes. <laughs> Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Aisha Jamal. I'm a Canadian film programmer at Hot Docs, and it's my pleasure to be moderating today's discussion of Almaya Tailfeather's documentary, Gimami Bitsin, The Meaning of Empathy. I would like to thank the National Film Board of Canada for organizing today's event. And I hope you had a chance to see the film. And if you haven't yet, you can still check it out after this discussion as part of its world premiere at the Hot Dogs Online Film Festival. I would like to start by asking our panel to introduce themselves and tell us where they are zooming in from. So let's start with the producer and writer of the film, Elmaya Tailfeathers. Uh, okay, uh, my name is Elamaya of Finiskim Tail Feathers. Um, I come from Kainai, or the Blood Reserve, um, but I am zooming in from the uh, ancestral uh, traditional territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations, which is now known as the city of Vancouver. Um, and I'm so happy to be here. And I'm also really happy to introduce Lori Eagleplume, who is one of our uh, generous documentary participants. Uh, Lori, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, my name is Laura Eagleplum. I'm one of the participants that's part of the documentary, and I'm zooming in from the Blood Reserve, also known as Kainai, and I am very honored and proud to be a part of the documentary and a part of this event today. Great. Uh, welcome, Laurie. Welcome, Elmaya, and Dr. Esther Tailfeathers, if you could introduce yourself. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Nistu uh, Nitaniko Magwineskiaki. I'm uh, the mother of Elamaya Tailfeathers, uh, and I'm born and raised here on the Blood Reserve, uh, and I've been a family physician here for 20 years plus, and uh, come from the Confederacy, Blackfoot Confederacy. So welcome to everybody. Uh, before we start with our discussion today, I would like to begin with an audience poll. So if you're joining us on Zoom, you will see pop up on your screen two questions as part of our poll. If you're on our YouTube channel, unfortunately, you can't take part. But the first question is, have you already seen the film? Yes or no, not yet. The second question is, had you heard of harm reduction before watching this film? We're going to get the results right away and I'll share them as they pop up on the screen. I want to remind you that if you have a question for a panel, you can put them at any point into the Q&A box at the bottom of your control panel. If you are on YouTube, you can just enter them into the chat box um, right next to the screen. 
So I'll give everybody a minute to answer these two questions and then we will share the results. Uh, it looks like we have half and half. Half the audience has seen the film, the other half has not yet. And over 90% of you know what harm production is. So that's really great. Um, so before we go to our audience questions, I wanted to start with a couple of questions. And I wanted to ask you, Elmaya, one of the things we notice in the trailer is that you provide the voiceover. We also get to meet part of your family in the film. And I wanted to ask you why you chose to share and focus on your own family and on your community in this film. Uh, well, I was hearing from my mother um, about everything she was witnessing through her work. And I was also just witnessing the huge amount of grief and loss that was happening in our community. Um, and as a filmmaker, I felt an urgency and a responsibility to document what was happening in my community, um, especially because the news media was often misrepresenting our community and wasn't showing the strength of our people and also all of the hard work that was happening from within the community. Um, and so I wanted to be able to provide the outside world with just a glimpse into how um, strong our people are and how much hard work was happening there. Um, and yeah, so I guess, I guess that's why I decided to do it. Mm -hmm. Dr. Tailfeathers, I wanted to ask you if you could tell us what you think the rest of Canada could learn from your community's experience with harm reduction. Well, first, I think it's important that uh, the rest of Canada understands why we are where we're at. And a lot of it is historical policy, colonial uh, policy uh, since the very beginning. And um, also like the trauma that people have an intergenerational trauma, which they have uh, carried from residential school and how it actually has harmed our population. And what you see, you know, what you see happening to people is a direct result of the trauma that children experienced in residential school. Um, also a lot of the social determinants and poverty, which are a, a secondary um, major factor in, um, in the addictions situation that we're in and also the lack of primary care or adequate primary care which all of those factors um, also can contribute to other people indigenous people across the country i just wanted to say that uh, maya's film is like a mirror to us but a window to canada oh, that's a beautiful way of putting it uh, Laurie, I wanted to ask you, you're in the film and you share a part of your journey and the harm reduction. Can you tell us why you agreed to participate in this film? Yes. Um, so when um, I've, I met with Dr. Tailfeathers and when she first asked me that her daughter Amaya was doing a documentary and if I was willing to speak with her, um, I agreed to it. And when I first spoke with Amaya, um, you know, it was, it wasn't filming then, we just spoke one-on-one. -on -one. And so when we did start filming, I didn't know it was going to be like, be this big, <laughs> like a lot of people would see the documentary. But for me, um, the reason why I wanted to share my story was because um, there's a lot of people on our reserve and a lot of close people to me as well that are struggling with addictions and I thought you know this could be a good way to try and a start for me as well to get my story out there and try and help others and know that you know nobody's alone there are people struggling just as much as they are so um, that was why I thought this would be a good opportunity for me to share my story. Mm -hmm. And Lori, I have to also point out that there's over 100 people zooming in right now. So that's really great to see and hear as well. <laughs> that's awesome. So hearing you. <laughs> um, I want to keep encouraging everyone to keep popping their questions into um, the Q&A box. I see you've already started to do so. You can upvote questions there. If you really want one answered, make sure you press the up button on it. I have a question here, and this is uh, for Dr. Tailfeathers first, and then I'll throw it over to you, Lori, as well. How have the harm reduction efforts in your community been affected by COVID this year? Um, the, the, actually, across the province, and I'm sure across the country, COVID has really affected the, um, the access to treatment, the access to, uh, to safe uh, consumption sites, and we've seen um, uh, at least a doubling of the deaths across the country due to overdose. 
Uh, we were doing very well prior to COVID. Uh, we have a number of strategies, which you would see in the film. Uh, but this year is the worst year for us. We have lost 91 people to overdoses, uh, which is the highest ever. So it has significantly impacted us. And it is because of lack of access to, um, to help. Oh, wow. Uh, Lori, did you want to weigh in? How has uh, COVID affected your community? Oh, wow. Um, COVID has really affected our community in a big way. You know, everybody's struggling in their own way, um, you know, because there's not much to do. And, you know, a lot of lives being lost because of COVID. Um, you know, for me, it, it hit me really personally, too, because um, my mom might have died from COVID as well. Um, it hasn't really been determined, but she did have COVID when she passed away. So yeah, it really has affected, you know, a lot of us in, in our community in a big way, you know, everybody's being isolated in their own house. And I understand there's a lot of, you know, with summer coming up, a lot of people want to get out there, but it's just, it can't happen, you know. So I, I know a lot of people are doing their part to um, help stop the spread, especially vaccine shots, everything. A lot of people, you know, had their opinion on the vaccine alone, but, you know, um, once it was out there, social media, for me, I talked to a lot of people. So, you know, it, it helps when you talk to others and really um, share parts of what COVID, how you're struggling with COVID, and, you know, it helps other people really think about, you know, it, it will help, you know, it may not get rid of COVID all together, but, you know, it's a start, it's a, it will help. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for that, Lori, and I'm sorry to hear about your mom. We do have a comment here from um, Paul, and he says, I want to express my gratitude to Elmaya, Esther, and Lori for contributing such a powerful, heartfelt, and personal film. There were many points in the film where I was brought to tears. Um, thank you for that comment. I also have a question from the audience for Dr. Tailfeathers. After watching your film, I think I finally understand harm reduction. The light came on. Thank you. What has been effective in changing your community's attitude about harm reduction? I think the fact that people have the ability to save lives, it's not just doctors, nurses, and paramedics, but the learning of how to use naloxone and harm reduction to save lives. Uh, is very important and once people know that they have the power to help save another human being's life it really does um, make a difference. Mm -hmm. um, for Elmaya we have a question here many filmmakers will be hesitant to embark on a major project with their mother what was that like for you? Uh, well I think my mom is just used to being involved in my work now. <laughs> um, it was wonderful to work with my family and my community and my mother especially. Um, it's, uh, it's a very different approach when, when you're working with people who are so close to home. And um, uh, I was just absolutely honored and humbled to, to go and film my community and film the work that people like my mother were doing and, and uh, film the stories of people like Lori. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm so grateful that I had that opportunity um, and I would, do it all over again if I could. You're going to give us none of the dirt, Amaya. <laughs> there wasn't any. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Tailfeathers, I have another question for you. How do you get past the anger, the inadequate, invalidating responses, the overdose crisis in your surrounding settler community? It's very difficult. And uh, I, I don't know if we had talked about moral injury, but many physicians, nurses, and healthcare providers, as well as social workers, feel what's called moral injury. And sometimes you feel burnout because you cannot help all the people who are uh, feeling the impact of um, being vulnerable and being treated um, not human, not as human as others. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is, it, it can make you very angry. And um, I think we just have to focus on making it better and working on strategies. If we get weighed down by the negativity of others, we just can't move ahead. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I have another comment here that says, first, want to congratulate all of you on a very beautiful and important film. Wondering if there are plans or hopes to share the film in communities like Lethbridge or other communities where you've encountered severe misunderstandings of and, hostile, and hostility towards harm reduction. So maybe I'll throw that at you, Elmaya. So are there any plans to share the film in places like Lethbridge? Yeah, I, I certainly hope so. Um, we're working on trying to build an impact campaign or figure out how to get it into communities um, during this COVID era. Uh, but there is there is a, a private screening coming up in Lethbridge um, with, with a social workers group there. Um, but I, yeah, I certainly hope that the film gets seen um, by the people who maybe don't have uh, the proper understanding or proper understanding of what harm reduction is. Um, and I don't, I, I don't, how do I put this? Uh, racism is so explicit on the prairies um, and it's so deeply embedded in, in um, settler attitudes that people don't even necessarily realize that they're carrying such uh, racial bias in, in the way that they think about our, our people. Um, and that influences policy, it influences um, how our people are treated in the healthcare system. Um, and in this case, it, it impacts harm reduction services. Um, and so, I, yeah, I certainly hope people who have some sort of influence on policy making um, and also just the general public in, in Lethbridge and Cardston and, and Southern Alberta see this film. Um, but I think our community story is so similar to so many other Indigenous communities. And so I hope, um, I hope Canadians see this film and, and um, gain a deeper understanding as to, you know, the root causes of addiction or substance use disorder um, and the value of harm reduction. Um, really thoughtful film and a beautifully presented story, a very powerful. And this question is for you, Elmaya. How are George and Leah? Can you give us an update on their lives? Uh, well, my mom just saw Leah this morning. Um, I haven't seen them since I was home uh, last fall when my grandfather passed away. Um, and they, as you see in the film, they ended up in treatment and then COVID hit and treatment centers in Alberta sent everybody home. Um, so after years of trying to get into treatment, um, the pandemic interrupted their, their ability to, to get treatment. Um, so they're, they're in the same situation as they were when we started the film. And I think it really speaks to uh, the necessity for, for building safe and supportive housing for people who live with substance use disorder. Um, it's, it's a really vicious cycle in that um, if people get into treatment, uh, which, you know, there's so many hurdles to even getting there, but when they leave, th there's no housing for them. They end up um, in George and Leah's situation. Uh, and so it's totally understandable that, um, that they are really struggling to find stability. Mm -hmm. um, Mom, how was Leah when you saw her this morning? She was doing really well. Uh, just happy to drop by and um, and say hello. So it was really nice to see her this morning. Mm, great. I have a question here that's for all three of you. Um, the question is: Can each of you expand on the black the Blackfoot word kimayiptisin, the concept to explain it to others who are not Blackfoot? Lori, do you want to perhaps begin with that? Um, do you want to say that one more time, please? Um, do you want to tell us what the word Gima um, Yiptisin or the concept means to you? Oh, the concept. It, mm -hmm. The meaning of empathy. Um, it means helping one another. Um, I'm sorry. Um, you know, I can give you a minute to think and I'll just throw it over to <laughs> Elmaya. Please, sorry. It's okay. uh, I think Gimma Bibitsen is what Lori does every single day um, in taking care of her family and raising her um, niece and nephews and um, taking care of Shay and Mariah and guiding them on their, their recovery journey and supporting them as young people. Um, I think Gimma Bibitsen is what my mother does every day in the community and um, in caring for our people, no matter 
what their situation is. Um, yeah, gimma bibitsen is is to have compassion and empathy and and um, to I, I guess just treat everybody with dignity and respect. Yeah. And Dr. Tailfeathers, do you want to add anything to that, or was that pretty? <laughs> I think that was pretty good. Um, I'm trying to answer these questions and <laughs> so I'm really sorry. I guess I shouldn't be um, typing and answering questions. And um, yes, I, I think that my adequately, adequately covered that. I think that, uh, you know, the practicality and the practical things that you see within the film show a lot of uh, kindness, generosity and compassion. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. Laurie, anything to add? Um, I may have said it all, but it is true, like helping others, um, those who are struggling, know that they're not alone and just helping one another. Yeah. I have a question here for Elmaya. There is a haunting comment in the film saying the substance abuse problem started right at colonization. How important was it for you to emphasize that connection in the film? Uh, well, it, it's, it's, it's impossible to, um, to separate the two in terms of substance use disorder and and our community and indigenous people as a whole. I, I think in so many cases, people are um, self-medicating because, because of pain. And that has to do with intergenerational trauma. And that trauma stems from um, all of the pain that's been inflicted because of settler colonialism. Mm -hmm. um, and so often that pain is historicized, like it's, it's placed in the, the distant past as though um, we should just get over it. And I think often settlers, especially in places like Alberta, don't realize that it's ongoing, that there, there's consistently, um, every day we face, we, we face inequity and, and racism and poverty, all of these things, they directly contribute to substance use disorder. And so, um, for me, it, it kind of felt like it was almost like stating the obvious, um, but but it, it it had to be told through through people's lived experiences. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we have a comment here that says, "Hello, Esther and Maya. Lovely to see you." Dr. Bruce Alexander, who did the Rap Park research, says that the roots of addiction are linked to dislocation and disconnection. Can you talk a bit about the importance of connecting with the land and with the culture for the people? for the people of Kainai as part of a harm reduction approach? Uh, maybe I'll actually ask Dr. Tailfeathers to start with that and then Amaya, if you wanna weigh in. Okay, I think that, um, I think that the, in a historical context, um, the policies, the historical um, colonial policies have removed um, a major number of those things for one, we, we had a large territory, which was our hunting territory, you know, where we gathered um, plants, where we had all of that. And when we were um, assigned to a reserve, we no longer were um, the nomadic people that we were and, um, and we were no, no longer able to hunt the way we were. So much of our, our lifestyle had changed a lot and it was replaced by rations. It was be replaced by uh, soon a welfare system. So you know, there's so many disconnects. One is from actually living on the land and living off the land to becoming dependent on, uh, on a, foreign, um, a foreign entity. And so uh, our dependency issues are huge as we were removed from our, our traditional lifestyle. And so uh, returning to a lot of that, um, hunting is very important for our young men. Our young women are, are learning a lot about, uh, you know, uh, cooking many of our people are, are really into traditional cooking now and uh, the um, recovery of our language and um, so many young people speaking our language uh, the importance of Sundance and the growth of our our, our central ceremony um, that's all um, building our health back to where it should be although it will never get to the point it was before um, but replacement from land replacement from uh, purpose, replacement from families, and, and certainly the, the most um, damaging is uh, residential schools and today uh, foster care and the child welfare system, which removes our, our children completely from our communities. So definitely um, many steps away from where we were initially. Mm -hmm. 
Amaya, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I think um, there's a lot of work that's happening um, in terms of uh, in terms of implementing culture and um, and connection to the land and all of those things in terms of uh, recovery and, and treating substance use disorder. Um, I wasn't able to cover it too much in the film, but the Indigenous Recovery Coach Program, for instance, they um, they they offer a lot of cultural programming. Um, they have elders who work in the program. They offer ceremony and um, cultural support for people who are in recovery or who on who are on opioid agonist therapy. Um, the Kaina Healing Lodge also is very much rooted in. Um, in culture and, and ceremony. I don't know how much they do in terms of connecting to the land, um, but it's it's complicated in, in the prairies, especially because so much of our land has been turned into um, farm and ranch land. And so the relationship with the land has shifted a lot, um, but there are some really incredible people within the community who are who are working on that. And, and as my mom said, there's a lot of young people who are really committed to language revitalization and, and learning the culture. And um, our Sundance is the biggest it's ever been. Um, if you ever watched the Circle of the Sun film, the NFB film by Colin Lowe, um, it, the Sundance is painted as like, as though it's about to die and it'll never happen again, but it's the biggest it's ever been. So I think, culture and ceremony is is thriving in our community and um, I wish I could have covered more of that in the film. Mm. You all work hard to give kindness as you say despite the barriers of racism. What helps you in your effort to self-care? So maybe Lori I'll ask you to start with that one. Self-care? Effort for self-care yeah. Oh I like to spend a lot of time with my family. <laughs> um, Family is everything to me. Um, you know, my daughter stays with me as well. And, you know, she struggled with addiction for a while. I feel bad. I feel like it was my fault, the reason why she got into it. But, you know, I, I helped her and her boyfriend, you know, get off the drugs. And, move, and when she got pregnant, she stayed with me and made me a grandma. So that's been really exciting for me. And, for our family. It's just all about family for me pretty much. And, you know, work on the other place I'm allowed to go to. So, you know, being around work is, and my coworkers there, they're my other family. So just being around them, you know, just, you know. <laughs> That's beautiful. Uh, Dr. Tailfeathers, what about you? What do you do for self-care? Uh, currently, I'm so anxious to start putting my garden in and uh, <laughs> spend a lot of time outside. Yeah, that's great. And Elmaya? Um, I have a dog who I love very much and uh, <laughs> taking her for walks and runs and I'm starting my garden pretty quick now. And yeah, just trying to... Um, I, I honestly feel like this film was self-care in a sense because uh, it was such an honor to be able to express my love and respect for my community in, in my work and being able to go home and actually work in my community was an incredible experience because working in the film industry, I have to be in Vancouver and Toronto and Montreal and I'm rarely ever able to work in my own community. And so that was one of the most fulfilling experiences of my life. So I almost feel like the film was, was self-care. Mm. Has Dr. Tailfeather's experience mm. brought her new insights about har how harm reduction can be advanced countrywide? This is a question for you, Dr. Tailfeathers. Uh, I think that it's very necessary to understand harm reduction and to start, lo uh, to start looking at how we can save lives and how we can support people from you know, from a different perspective, I think uh, the opposite of, I mean, I think abstinence is, and there was a time for that, but we're starting to understand more about addictions and that it's not simply quitting, uh, which we, which we, we experienced in our, in our situation. Um, I think that, um, you know, hopefully the two ends of the spectrum where people believe in um, harm reduction and recognize how important it, how important it is, versus the far right end of the spectrum where people don't have any 
they don't see any value in it. Um, I think what brings people together on that spectrum is uh, having a family member who suffers or have losing a, a very close uh, family member or friend to addiction. Uh, it helps to bring perspective to the needs that we have across the country. And that, uh, you know, it's, it, it isn't um, any one culture specifically, we all share addictions and we um, need to all share empathy. Mm -hmm. Laurie, a uh, question for you. What do you hope audiences take away from the film? What do you hope it communicates to the outside world for Indigenous and settler audiences? Well, for one, I just want people to know that, you know, struggling with addiction, there's no shame in it. Um, don't be ashamed of what life you're living um, and that there is, there is help out there. Um, you know, and that you're not alone. Um, I just, I pray that people that watch it kind of get an understanding as to, um, I don't know if, if I'm allowed to talk about this as well, but Suboxon was one of the reasons I was able to get off the drugs and it really helped me get my life back. And and I know a lot of people were against it, um, but you know, it, it it, it really changed my life, you know, it gave me my life back, you know, if it, if it wasn't for Dr. Tail Feathers and the ones that stepped in and helped me, there's no telling where I would have been right now. So, you know, there is, there is hope, there is help out there. And just know that you're not alone. A lot of people struggle with the exact same thing. And, you know, life, there is a second chance out there for you. I have a question for Dr. Tailfeathers. What are your opinions on the current children's services system? In your eyes, is it a continuation of residential schools? Yes, I think it is. I think the adverse childhood events that um, our children um, or our ancestors felt in residential school are also being felt within the child welfare system. Um, I understand too that there are very many parents within the child welfare system who are good parents but do not understand the importance of removing a child from their uh, culture. Uh, you know, we see a, a spectrum from um, people telling ch their foster children um, that they are that way because their children, I mean, that their people are either um, stupid or, you know, all of these things. So there's a negative image of, um, of who they are or what their identity is. And coming back to the community is very difficult for them because they haven't got the uh, connections and they haven't got the family there that uh, family bonds that, that, that uh, normally exist in a healthy childhood. So um, I, I understand the reason for it. And I wish that uh, we could try to work on not breaking those bonds and supporting mothers as much as possible to keep their children beside them. And that was uh, one of the, the aims that we had within our safe withdrawal site is to uh, not break the bond between mother and child. So we follow them to the hospital, we follow the delivery and we bring the child back home to the detox with them. So they are not apprehended and we try to work with them um, supporting the bond and a beautiful thing is that many of the uh, residents the other residents or clients within the uh, the safe withdrawal site will support mom like family so when she needs to rest somebody else will take baby or feed baby or you know or continue to support mom so it's I know it's an artificial environment but it also um, it also provides that um, caring that child needs so I have a question for all three of you. Empathy seems to be generally in short supply and sizable minority of society. What two things can we do to start changing that? So what can we do to create more empathy is the question. Um, I'm gonna let you guys think about it, but maybe I'll start with you, Elmaya, and then over to you, Dr. Tailfeathers and Lori after that. Oh man, that's a tough question. Um, I think it comes down to humanizing experiences and, and stories. Um, in the case of this film, it was about humanizing uh, the face of the opioid crisis um, and, and, it, and the addictions crisis in our community. Um, so it was about 
showing the real lived experiences of people who are in recovery or who have substance use disorder um, and framing them through a lens of compassion and empathy um, in hopes of, of, of people gaining a better understanding of what their struggles are. Um, and also just framing them beyond just their addiction um, and, and showing them as the, the fully formed, wonderful human beings that they are who have hopes and dreams and family who love them and, and family who they love. Um, and so, yeah, I don't know how we generate empathy uh, beyond just trying to, to bring it to a human level of, of uh, human experience. Great. Dr. Tailfeathers, what can we do to generate more empathy? Well, empathy, I think, is based on experience. And um, many of us who are in the community experience it day to day because we have loved ones that are struggling. But for those who have um, who are distant from uh, the struggle of addictions, I think the next best thing is something that what as what Maya has done is the film. It brings, you know, a more human, like she said, aspect to it. But the experiential part of it is so important for human beings. And without recognizing another person's suffering and not seeing yourself in that suffering, uh, it's very hard to have empathy. Lori, what about you? What do you think we can do to have more empathy? Um, well, I think, you know, just try and understand others that are struggling with their addictions and, you know, um, offer help if they need it. And, you know, share your stories and your struggles um, with them as well. And just know that there is hope that they, is, like I said, there's a second chance out there. You know, it's never too late to reach for your goals, your dreams. Great. I have a question for Dr. Tailfeathers. Is there a way for members of the sober community and our harm reduction community in Canada to help assist you those who are struggling with addiction and volunteer via Zoom or phone, um, for example, sponsorship, donating funds or resources. So the question is, how can people help out? I think uh, we, have to, we have to hit it at a higher level. Uh, I really appreciate the donations and there are many people outside our community that send uh, you know, clothing donations, um, bedding and all, all kinds of things as well as um, arts and activities as, and money to the community. But I think we have to hit it at a higher level in understanding and getting our, our leaders, uh, our national leaders and provincial leaders to understand the importance of harm reduction and that it isn't something uh, evil, it's something necessary in order to, um, to heal our people across the country. And, um, and often people are not understanding that, um, that better health outcomes also um, result in better, better economic health, uh, health, I mean, better economic outcomes. Um, and I think that uh, return on investment is really important to understand investing in harm reduction treatment and those people that have uh, addictions actually will have a re return on investment to our healthcare system. Uh, I have a question for Elmaya. Are there any documentaries on the effects of fentanyl abuse on new babies? Would that be a project that you would be interested in pursuing? It'd be a good time now. These babies are now entering kindergarten, early elementary school years, dot, dot, dot. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I haven't, I haven't really seen anything about that. And um, I think my mom would know a lot more about it than I do. And uh, I think I'm kind of, um, yeah, we're, I'm considering trying to maybe develop this feature into a, a series of some sort because I shot it for almost four years. We worked on this for close to, well, yeah, five years. Um, and there's so much footage that didn't end up in the film and so many stories that didn't end up in the film and uh, themes that I'd still like to explore. So yeah, maybe that might be something we could, we could touch on and, um, uh, yeah, definitely thinking about how all of this is impacting the next generation. Great. I have a last question. Uh, this one is for Elmaya and Dr. Tailfeathers. What do you hope people take away from the film? Maybe Dr. Tailfeathers, I'll start with you. 
I think understanding that uh, there are many vulnerable people uh, with addictions and we need to be um, more caring of them and more uh, empathetic of them. Um, and the outcomes are much better once we do um, have that. And I think that we need to, as a, as a nation, understand that our nation is affected by, um, by this and it, it isn't uh, strictly one population. We are all affected by it. So we all need to try to understand it. Great. Elmaya? Um, I hope that people walk away with a sense of hope um, and an understanding that people with uh, substance use disorder deserve to be treated with dignity and humanity and respect. Um, and that people who live with substance use disorder and those who are in recovery need to be centered in this conversation. Um, so often their voices are uh, erased or absent from the conversation, um, which is a very paternalistic view uh, of, of how we move forward together. Um, and so I certainly hope that, that people understand that we need to listen to people with lived experience, people like Lori, people who know what it's like to live with substance use disorder and how challenging the road to recovery can be. Um, and uh, I also hope that people walk away with um, the same sort of respect and love that I have for the people of Kainai and everything that, um, that our people are capable of. Mm, great. Uh, before we end today, I actually do want to read out two lovely um, comments we got from the audience. The first one says, I'd like to thank Lori for sharing your story with us. Keep up the good work and you are setting a good model for your family. Also, thank you, Dr. Tailfeathers and Amaya so much for putting the film uh, forward for Canadian audiences to learn what the damaging reality and facts are. Uh, Dr. Tailfeathers has lots of love in her big heart to help people who need her help. And then we have another comment that says, congratulations, Elmaya, on the launch of your film. I felt a wide range of emotion while watching it, including rage at the injustice that the blood people have endured for 140 plus years. I applaud Lori for her strength. And I thank Esther for saying to a young man seeking help, I am so glad you came today. That statement needs to become mandatory for healthcare professionals when assisting people who use drugs. Thank you so much for these really wonderful comments. I want to thank everybody for joining us today. I want to remind you that this film plays till May 9th at the Hot Dogs Online Festival. You can vote for it. Um, it's up for the Rogers Audience Award, so make sure you vote after you see the film. The National Film Board of Canada will be hosting three more filmmaker Q&As. The next one will be Monday night at 7 p.m. with Shauna McDonald, the director of the short documentary Into Light. And I also want to let you know that if you love this discussion today, you can share it with family and friends. The National Film Board of Canada will be uploading today's discussion onto its YouTube channel in the next few days. And I want to thank Elmaya, Dr. Tailfeathers, and Lori for joining us and for your very generous answers. Thank you so much. Have a lovely day. Thank you.